I'm driving on sunshine today. And what that means is that this car is currently powered by excess electricity from our solar electric system. What's cool about electric cars is that their energy source can come from so many different places. Coal, nuclear power, natural gas, or solar energy, it doesn't matter as long as it's electricity. And in the case of this car, and how we're driving right now, the energy came from excess power from our solar panels mounted on our RV. And today, we're gonna show you how we do it. So this is our Chevy Volt, and it's a pretty unique vehicle. This car is primarily an electric vehicle. It's got a built-in battery, and we can plug it in and drive just on electric power. But it also has a gasoline generator built into it to extend its range. This car's design is called a series hybrid vehicle, and not many cars have been designed like this. Actually, this is really the only mass-produced series hybrid vehicle available as of the date of this video. Being a series hybrid, it means that it is primarily an electric vehicle, and the generator just generates electricity for the electric motor to use. While quite unique in passenger vehicles, series hybrid designs are actually commonly used in diesel locomotives and large ships because of energy efficiencies in the way those vehicles operate. Now what this means for us is that we get the benefits of both an electric car and also a gasoline powered car all in one. But because of the complexities of all the systems that go into that, this car has actually been replaced by a longer range battery electric vehicles in place of the complex series hybrid. This, however, works really well for what we're doing with it, which is dumping excess solar power to the car so that we can drive as much on solar powered electric energy as possible. This car has a range of 40 to 50 miles on its internal battery power before it needs to turn on that gasoline generator to extend the range. And with the gasoline generator, it'll go well over 300 miles. 50 miles may not sound like a lot, but it's truthfully about 90% of our driving and most people's driving when you're just commuting to work or driving around town. For us, we're able to dump excess solar power to the car, but if we have a whole bunch of cloudy days or not enough power, it just switches over to the gasoline and we're still able to use the car. So cars require a lot of energy and it's easier to quantify how much energy they require when it's electric. This car can accelerate with over 100,000 watts of power. And this is really just a basic car. Uh, Tesla can accelerate with over 500,000 watts of energy. For example, that's 15 homes with 100 amp service, all maxing out their power just to accelerate a car. Because they require so much energy, they typically have large battery banks, which makes a great place to dump excess solar energy. This car has a battery with about 15,000 watt hours of storage capacity, and it charges with this little door right up front. We open it up and we use a charging plug that just plugs into the car, clicks in, and the car will start charging as long as we're plugged in on the other end. Now, there are lots of different ways that we can plug this car in with a basic 120 volt charging port like this, which charges the car pretty slowly. It takes about eight to 10 hours to fully charge the car on a 120 volt circuit but it can also plug into a 240 volt circuit and charge at around four hours. It's so neat that it doesn't matter where the electricity is coming from, that an electric car can charge on it. And in the case of this car, it's excess solar power. If you wanna know how we built our solar electric system on our RV that charges this car, we put two videos together to showcase how that was done. But let's take a look now at the specific wiring we put in place to actually charge this car. So I'm in the basement of our RV where most of the electrical equipment for the solar system is installed. Basically what's happening is that the power from the solar panels on the roof come down into this compartment here and charge a very large battery bank to run the RV. The power from the battery bank is distributed into the RV's DC loads, but also runs to a very large inverter to convert the power from the DC into AC so that we can run typical appliances and even the car's charging system. That inverter is this 
big blue box right here. And we oversized this inverter specifically thinking that we were going to be charging the car. And the car's load is pretty significant. So if we still want additional capacity, we really had to oversize this inverter in the system. We also chose this inverter because it has a secondary AC output, which we can control in certain circumstances. And what we did is wired a dedicated circuit to the secondary AC output in this inverter and ran it to a plug so that we could plug the car's EVSE into it. EVSE stands for Electric Vehicle Supply Equipment, and in this case, it's this black box right here that basically plugs into the wall at one end, and at the other end has a cord that goes out and plugs into the car's specific charging port. Most electric cars have some sort of an EVSE between them and the grid because this has relays and circuits in it that make sure the car is ready to take a charge and make sure that the electrical circuit is working appropriately to protect the car's charging system, which is typically on board in the car. So all this is doing is checking the system, making sure the car is ready to charge and closing a set of relays to enable the car to charge. Now what's special about having a dedicated circuit for charging the car is that we are able to control it based upon the battery's state of charge, or SOC. What we do is when the batteries start filling up from the day's solar energy, when they hit 85%, we turn on this special car charging circuit and the car starts charging. It's kind of fun because the car honks briefly to let you know that it started charging. And while we're sitting around, the car just starts honking partway through the day. We go, oh, well, we know the batteries are at 85%. Now we chose 85% for our circumstance because we have so much solar power that even while the car is charging on a bright sunny day, we make enough power that it continues to add additional power to the system and raise the battery state of charge beyond 85%. If we started charging the car only when the batteries were at 100%, we would still be wasting some of that extra power. So at 85%, it enables us to kind of have a buffer. Now when the day ends, if the car is not charged, it starts drawing power from the batteries and not the solar because there's not enough sunlight anymore. This can also happen when the day clouds up and in that circumstance, the batteries start to drop. Because we're able to program this circuit to turn on and off whenever we want, we've got it set to turn off charging when the batteries reach an 80% state of charge, leaving us 80% capacity for overnight use or anything else that we need power for in the RV. Now for us, the 80% has been working really well because we have a large enough battery bank that it's still plenty of power. And if the car did get fully charged or we think we might need more power for cloudy days in the near future, we could of course unplug the car and store that extra power into our batteries instead of dumping it to the car. So the concept all sounds good, right? But how is it actually working? Well. For us, when we're stationary, like when we're on our property in Michigan or Florida, we typically have quite a bit of excess solar energy during the summer months. And almost all of our driving around town is on excess solar power. And it's been working out great, giving us infinite miles per gallon. Now that takes into account that we don't drive very much. And to really take advantage of the excess solar energy, we need to have the car plugged in during the midday. Otherwise, our batteries in the RV just get full. We don't really think about that. We just mainly use the car when we need it. But because it's every couple days that we drive, usually the car is fully charged by the time we need it. Or even if it's not fully charged, we at least get a good chunk of miles on the solar energy. Now, what about longer drives, like crossing the country? Well, it mainly is using the gasoline engine or generator in that circumstance. But we are able to supplement quite a bit of electric to increase our fuel economy. We reprogram the RV because we're not using the power in it during the day on drive days. We let it charge up the RV's batteries and then dump 80% of the RV's battery energy to the car overnight so that we have a good reserve of electric miles to start on the next day. Also, when we are stopped at rest stops or just taking a break, we plug the car in and frequently we'll get five to 10 extra miles just by plugging it in for a couple hours while we're resting and then we unplug it, keep driving, and it increases our fuel economy overall. 
On average, about 10% of our miles on long range drive days are electric, and it pushes our fuel economy to an average of about 60 miles per gallon when doing those long drive days. It's neat to consider, however, that we don't pay for the electricity to charge this car at all. It's all just free solar power. So as long as we drive the car, it's been doing a really good job of using all the excess solar energy. We're logged into our Victron VRM portal where all of our solar data is uploaded so we can take a look at what our state of charge of the batteries looks like versus how much power we're using. On this graph here, the yellow indicates how much solar energy we've generated and the red showcases how much AC or just power the RV is consuming. The blue line indicates the battery state of charge. So looking at just this two day period, we can see that the solar starts charging up during the day. And then there's a big red line where the car just automatically turns on and starts drawing excess energy. And you can see that the battery state of charge either stops climbing or significantly slows down. Also, when the battery state of charge drops back to 80%, it shuts off and the level just kind of slowly drops overnight. The goal here is basically never to get the batteries fully charged and use all that extra solar power. So we can look at over time how this works and it works pretty darn well, keeping our batteries from 50 to 80% state of charge, leaving us that buffer for cloudy days. But if we don't drive the car enough, like in this circumstance right here, we actually do get the batteries fully charged. Or maybe we weren't there during the day to charge the car, so we started charging it later in the evening, and then the batteries were drawn down to around 80%. While stationary and just mainly using the car for around town commuting or going to see attractions, we use almost 100% electric and we actually only burned one gallon of gas in an entire summer's worth of driving because most of it was the solar power. It works really well as a tow vehicle even though we're not actually towing it. We drive it behind the fifth wheel when we want to have it with us. But as a tow vehicle, having a car that can drive on electric and use the excess solar power from an RV really seems to make a lot of sense to us. So as for actually driving an electric car, we've really enjoyed it. Check this out. So quiet, just a little tiny bit of a whine. The acceleration is fast and responsive. The car is nimble and they can be charged from any different sources. We've really enjoyed driving this car. It's been such a pleasant experience. And if you haven't tried out driving an electric car, I highly recommend that you try one out because it might make sense, especially for an around town type car. It's been working out so well for us. And also the maintenance on electric cars is minimal to almost none compared to their gasoline counterparts. So it's a much more cost-effective car to own over time. So the car is not the only electric vehicle we charge. We also charge our electric bikes. We don't have a dedicated circuit that we plug them into when we have excess power. We just plug them in when we know we have enough solar power to charge them up. They don't use near as much energy and it might be an opportunity to use some excess power for a vehicle if you have a smaller solar system. Now it doesn't have to be an electric vehicle to take advantage of excess solar energy in an RV. RVs usually have dual purpose appliances and you could program things like the fridge to switch over from propane to electric when the batteries are near charged. We frequently use an induction cooktop to use electric energy instead of cooking on propane when we have plenty of solar power or battery. You could also turn on a dedicated circuit to maybe click on a small electric heater when you are in a cold climate to again use excess energy. For RVs that have gas electric water heaters, it's really easy to just switch the water heater over to electric as well and heat up that water on excess solar power. Overall, using excess solar power is really not that difficult. You just need to know what your state of charge of your battery system is and or how much energy your home is consuming and then use some logic to turn on and off certain things to maximize that solar energy. In the case of our car, it is a really low level easy thing to do as we're just using that second AC output right off our inverter. 
So overall, this vehicle is our secondary vehicle, our towed vehicle, if you will, has been working out really well and it's really optimized our solar system. We think that it's a really cool idea to use vehicles to optimize solar systems so that you can oversize them and use all that excess power when you need it or charge a vehicle. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you next time.